Welcome to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. Right. It's crazy. So it's like, it's the, the internet really just, I think you were, I don't know if you were, were you the, was there someone else who was Michael Ellis ish, or were you the first one to just kind of no. take off on the internet? On the, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. Cause like I'm, I'm on the internet. I'm terrible about all of the stuff. So I use it like everybody else does, but mm -hmm. I, to order I, pizza. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, there were many other trainers that were spreading good information ahead of that. So mm -hmm. Ivan Balabanov and I came up around the same time. He is a genius dog trainer. He and I are friends and would train together at various times. He, he was making content and things very early on. He has books and videos, which I, he's extremely gifted. Before that, it was mostly done through seminars and things like that. Mm -hmm. and there were many good trainers that would go to clubs, organizations, and that kind of stuff for educational experiences or conferences and that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the the actual kind of established trainers, it just happened that I'd been doing that for a long time when the internet really started to kick up in mm -hmm. that sense. And so that kind of allowed me- For YouTube, where YouTube started taking off. Yeah, so that allowed that sort of slide out. And I like honest to be honest, I still don't even remotely use it to the best of advantage. I'm terrible about it. If Learberg weren't throwing out the stuff for me, then it would it would be bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. I get that. I totally yeah. get that. Um, that's cool. So it's a, I, I like how you guys you guys connected. You know. Um, yeah. It would. Does, do you think Learberg was a little bit of a launching pad because they kind of had some? Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah, there's yeah. no doubt. Like, so Ed had been. He got on the internet very early, so uh, he, he'll tell the story, but he, he, a friend of his from college was a professor in computer science or something at one of the universities, and very early in the commercial aspects of the internet, right? Said, you need to get in here. And so Ed had a website up selling dog stuff way early, one of the first commercial dog sites there. And so he was well established and had a mailing list and all that kind of stuff, so that when I st he started to get my content out there and I'm positive there's no way the number of people would have seen me that have seen me without without Learberg and, without Learberg. and yeah. Yeah, they for sure um, have been great and I'm a terrible marketer like I don't like it like so <laughs> I'm training, I'm training trainers to be professional trainers and they always ask me like so you know what's your strategy for marketing and I, my I say <laughs> I do good, do good work and people will notice you and they'll tell other yeah. people that's really like that's yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. It's true, well, dude. That's not really helpful. <laughs> like, do you think about Facebook ads or what? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Now, nowadays, it's just like just have someone follow you with a camera and just do whatever you do. Yeah, and that's marketing. Well, that's it's crazy right. how marketing has changed these days. I mean, some of the biggest channels on YouTube, for example, are just vlogs of people doing pretty much nothing, but they get like 15 million views per video, and it's just like, hey, I'm going to the store, I'm going to the park, and having right. nice shots and a bit of editing and some music and stuff and people eat that right up. But it's, it's such a weird thing where like my, my little sisters at my mom's house do this thing where they, they watch videos of little girls playing with dolls. They have toys of their own, but they, they watch these kids play with other toys. And I'm like, why is this so interesting? <laughs> yeah. We should be concerned. We should be concerned about it. <laughs> Each his or her own, but no way, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us about you, man. You have kids, you have a family. What's nope. going on? I, I have a wife of uh, 30 years now. And Whoa, that's amazing. We have, we have no kids, lots of dogs and other critters. We live in right. uh, Sebastopol, California, which is uh, in Sonoma, Western Sonoma County. Uh, okay. An hour north of San Francisco in wine country. Uh, Very quiet, nice. mellow place. Yep. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. yeah, that's it. My wife uh, was is a an actress and theater director. She had an MFA from Columbia in acting. And uh, uh, when the school took off and started to get busy, I stole her from her actual career and made her <laughs> and made her administrator of the school. So she doesn't get to do nearly as much theater these days as she would like, as she's too busy uh, <laughs> helping, helping you out. Helping yeah. Helping you out. It would not be happening without her by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, you have, having yeah. a good woman by your side, man, doing what you're doing, that's everything. That's everything. That's, that's everything. Um, so let's dive into another little question about the past. 
let's talk about, you know, like some people, they remember some of their like first element, like their favorite elementary school teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, they know them by name and they remember them and they remember the impact that they had on them. Let's talk about some of the people in your journey that have mm -hmm. really just impacted you where you were like, I will this, I say this because this person taught it to me when I was blank. Right. Yeah. Who are, who are those impactful people? So some of the, some of them are, are school teachers for sure before I, that have nothing to do with dogs. So certainly Mrs. Ostermeyer, a junior high English teacher. Uh, nice. like, uh, there are some people that, that really helped me uh, with my intellectual journey. And so as a teacher, yeah. they helped me kind of organize how I think and mm -hmm. be comfortable in front of people. And they made me read a lot and, made me curious about learning and a lot of that kind of stuff. So I had s several uh, teachers through through that. When we start talking about dog people, I have tons of them because, again, I came up through a club system. So um, mm -hmm. there are people, that, like many people, I learned. So the, the people that got me into dogs originally, the, the people that I took the initial obedience class at the German Shepherd Dog Club, there were a couple there. Victor and Harriet Gega, who owned Von Victor Kennels in San Diego County forever, long since passed. But um, they kind of grabbed me and said, like, hey, look, there's this whole other world of dog stuff. And right. they would let me kennel sit for them when they went on vacation. Oh, and, cool. all <laughs> and so there was all kinds of stuff that 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 sort of hooked me into that that world. Um, I worked for a veterinarian while I was in high school. Uh when when I was going to dog shows that was into showing dogs too in Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. that was very influential but the dog people uh, you when you train with a variety of people in clubs you wind up meeting a lot of people so there are a ton of trainers um in the Southern California area when I was coming up that I spent time so Al Banuelos was a well-known uh uh Schutzen trainer at the time I trained American Bulldogs and then eventually had Malinois I mentioned I Balabanov was coming up at the same time and his way of thinking was hugely influential there's a woman I wish I knew her name when I had learned training initially like everybody else at the time that I learned training we learned um pr straight up Keeler method pressure yeah. right yeah. A choke, choke foot leash and a choke in a choke chain and um there was a obedience club that shared one of the bite sport fields that we worked at. And there was an AKC obedience trainer there and she had a border collie and she was out doing obedience one day. And I, I wish I knew her name. I would love to call her and say, thank you. But she, uh, I I'm like, her dog doesn't look like our dogs. Like what? <laughs> that dog looks happy. What is she doing? Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I watched her train and talked to her a bit and it sent me off on a different journey. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I had seminars uh, that I went to like a Karen Pryor seminar back in the day when she was just starting and talking about clicker training and all that kind of stuff that was like changed the direction of my way of thinking about training and, and that kind of thing. Um, gosh, uh, Mitzi Robinson. Now she was Walker then uh, was a woman that ran a, a Schutzen club in San, in Northern, in Ramona, in Northern San Diego County mm -hmm. when I, when I grew up and, uh, I started doing helper work there and she showed me a lot, taught me a lot. And when you're in the club system, uh, and I was young and unattached. So we drove everywhere. The people mm -hmm. I trained with, well, uh, Lisa Mays, who was my partner in breeding dogs for many years. We came into that, that bite sport world around the same time, 1989, I met her. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, she had an incredible way of thinking about training was highly influential on the w way I thought about training as well. Um, what do you, what do you think the big takeaway was from that? From so her? for her, she, she was the, she was the, probably the original balance trainer in my opinion. Right? Wow. Wow. She was yeah, the queen of it. Like, so she was a very good pressure trainer and she would learn mm -hmm. pressure training like everybody else. And when she got attached to reward based training, she did a very good job of blending it. And hers was, really balanced right so these days when people talk about balance training a lot of people are using it as an excuse to use pressure right yeah yeah so yeah, yeah i get I, I did two days of food work and then i put an e-collar on the dog yeah yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, i'm a balanced trainer <laughs> kind of thing uh, yeah. she really had a balance and she also had an kind of out of the box way of thinking about things so it wasn't specifically techniques she just 
kind of read dogs well and thought about things differently. There was an empathic side to her. Than I do. Like, so I'm very analytical and very step by step. And mm -hmm. she had a kind of feel. And so she would approach a problem. And sometimes she would say something to me in a way that I was like, well, that's not the way I would have thought about it. And it makes you come at a problem in a different way. Ivan Balabanov is also the very, very much the same way. Like he is a dog training savant. Like he is a yeah. genius. And every once in a while he would say something or do something you know, that, that where I would say well, that shouldn't work. Why does it work? You know, kind of thing. And so it always made me pause and reevaluate things that I thought I knew, which is essential to you becoming a better trainer, right? You have to be yes. able to say like, we know things, but can you modify the, your knowledge and can you change your, your thinking about certain things? And that gets hard. The better you get at it and the more success you have, the harder it is to sort of shake up the way you think about things a little bit. Right. Um, Stuart, Dr. Stuart Hilliard is a good friend of mine. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. Actually, uh, who talked to us about Dr. Hilliard? It must've uh, been Tyler. Must've been Tyler. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Cause we were, that was post. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. He's no, dope. For sure. Like yeah, he's an amazing guy. Brilliant. A very good dog trainer. He was creating content. So before, if you want to talk early content, that was him in the eighties, he was doing videos for canine training systems, which was mm -hmm. like Learberg's competition, making dog training videos. They were a company in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and he did some videos on Schutzend and helper work and stuff in the, in the eighties. He was actually the person that, uh, hosted and brought, uh, French ring sport to the U S Oh, wow. The very first ring sport seminar in the U S was after Stuart made a trip to Europe and came back and, um, brought French trainers back and did a, a seminar at Colorado. I don't want to say in the mid eighties, 86, 87, something like that. Wow. He did a seminar here and that kind of brought that to the U S. Um, but, Watching his, he still, he, there's a, t a tape on protection work uh, that he did and he was decoying and he was showing foundation protection work. And as a decoy, and I don't want to go too far down this road because lots of people don't probably don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, the person getting bit by a dog in protection work is the person training the dog. Mm -hmm. you tend to, when people think of, the, of training their dog in protection, you're handling the dog. The person getting bit is the one that's teaching the dog, right? Right. The decoy, the helper, the agitator, whatever you want to call that person, their skills uh, drive your success. If you're going to be successful, it's because they are doing their work right. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's a kind of a, a reaction to the dog. You observe the dog, you read their body language, and when they do something, you need to react so that mm -hmm. they think they're making an impact on you, right? right. And it's a huge thing. And he was super dramatic in his reactions in this video, right? His <laughs> video, very dramatic. But that's when it clicked for me. Like, nobody explains it. You watch people work the dogs, and it doesn't look like they're doing anything. You can't see from the outside, but his reactions were big reactions. And I remember clearly at the time, I'm like, oh my God, that's my job to make the dog feel empowered. By <laughs> yeah. So, but his would be like, he'd stare at the dog and the dog right. would bark, and then it was like a wave of water. He'd throw his arms back like he was getting hit. <laughs> by a wave of water. And the big, but it made it obvious to somebody that was yeah. starting in that world of right. upper work. Kind of add a little of the theatrics to it a little and, bit. And, yeah. and to, and to, you, re, you saw it clearly. You saw it. It worked. Reaction. It, as opposed to some little subtle reaction that I might make where the dog's biting me and I twitch my arm a little in the, in the sleeve. You don't even see that from the outside. So right. I'm thinking, oh, and it was a game changer for me, like a <laughs> game changer, cool. right? And so I felt, it, I, I felt like I knew him before I met him the first time, right? right. Uh, just from watching him and I, and right. I want, yeah, it was incredible. So he had a, bi a big impact on the way I think about training. And then there were just many trained trainers from Europe that came over and did seminars, uh, other fr friends, people you meet along the way that you get a good idea here, you get a good idea there. Like watching good people train, uh, you pick up epic amounts of it. You Once you get your education to a certain point mm -hmm. and you know the core principles, mm -hmm. going and watching good trainers do their thing, which I had the luxury traveling around all the time of watching right scads of incredible trainers do their work and I pick up something here and something there.